Hey everybody, it's Cinnamon Cooney, your Art Sherpa, and today is an exciting day because I'm going to show you how to mix colors with acrylic paint. This course is going to be really focused for beginners, so if you've never ever tried to do color mixing before, this will be very, very perfect for you. On the mic is my husband, John. Hello. He's going to make sure that, uh, for the most part, because he's got to deliver right now, <laughs> and this is live, but for the most part that the camera is pointing at everything we're doing, that you can see the palette really well, and that we have questions. Now, on this particular show, we're going to do the live questions after I get through the instructions. So if you could put your questions all in caps, then the moderators will either send you the link that already answers that question, or they may put it together in our little database for after, and I will be answering that question at the end. So if it's something like you really have a question you want to answer it, I will be answering it. We're just doing that at the end. Now, this is really fun. Color mixing is really fun. I've taught it a bunch of different ways. Uh, another video I would recommend is the color tint tone shade chart is a color mixing class that I did that's really great if you need to know every color that the paint you have mixes. It's kind of, it's, it's a bit of a mental exercise, so I might do it after this one. Not first, I actually had my community do it first, but it is, when you haven't ever done it before, sometimes there's a bit of math where you're trying to make colors meet on the chart. <laughs> that can be a little much. So it's maybe after. We're gonna talk about secondary and tertiary colors, but really in pigment, we're kind of always in tertiaries because there's the bias of the pigment, which we talked about in our previous color mixing classes. If you haven't gotten to take in those, um, I put together a list, a playlist, and you can go through them. It starts with how to read a color, uh, color wheel, and it takes you all the way to here. And then we're going to be finishing this up next week, just getting ready for acrylic April with a how to use palette knives. And I'm going to throw a couple abstract techniques in there as well, just so you guys are kind of fully comfortable and ready to take that journey. All right, John's going to make me small. We're going to throw up a step. All right. And we're going to go into some oranges. Orange is great. Um, back to the beginning and everything. Yeah, okay. Oh, please be back before that. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. John's giving me control of my own control pad. Um, have we already done the step one? I don't know what he did. I'm going to put it up. All right, let's go over the palette that I've got here. So the colors on my palette, and these are the base colors that I tend to use. I sometimes also add yellow ochre to this, but for that, it's not really pertinent. We're just gonna use our base colors. Our cadmium red, quinacridone magenta, lemon yellow Hansa, that's now replacing our tight-knit yellow. But you can, if you, if you have tight-knit yellow, you can keep tight-knit yellow. It's a beautiful green yellow, I love it. Sometimes it's just hard to get. Uh, cad yellow medium, phthalo blue, ultramarine blue, the oxazine purple, burnt sienna, Mars black, Titanium white, phthalo green. Isn't that nice? Nice little rainbow colors. This is a split uh, primary palette with the convenience colors of green, black, brown, and purple. If you're not familiar with that, there was a video previous to this one that covers that and why we chose these colors. Let's start with oranges. Oh, well, maybe I don't need John. <gasps> don't tell him that. All right. So our basic, we have two reds and two yellows, and we know that um, orange is a mix of red and yellow. So let's put out our magenta. Rinse out. And we're going to put out like uh, perhaps our lemon yellow. Right. So we know we're going to be mixing magenta and lemon yellow. This is a nice way to write co color formulas in your book. I'm using the, um, and I really like this. This is in our store, the 1264 Fabriano Mixed Media pad, which is the 120 pound. This really does acrylic and watercolor and this type of work and ink and pencil and really heavy like mixed media techniques. So it is a very useful, useful pad to have around. All right, I'm going to mix these two together one to one and I'm going to make their medium orange. That's the that's the color that's really not biased yellow and not biased red between the two of them. All right, so we're going to go there. That's the medium orange they make. And it's a nice orange. It's a, it's a very lovely orange. It's got kind of a sherbety quality to it. I wouldn't say it's extremely vibrant in like the kinds of oranges we get with the cad yellows and the cad reds, but it's, it's really nice. Now, if I mix some more yellow into that, right, I'm gonna get my yellow orange. So this is my secondary. 
I'm adding more yellow. This is my tertiary, right? So that's the yellow orange that I have here. It's definitely more orange than this yellow, right? That's what they mean by the tertiary color yellow orange. If I come over here and add some more red into the mix, I get the tertiary red orange. Okay, so it should be a little more, actually I think I need to even go a little more red than that just to get it fully there. So you'll see it's not my magenta, it's not my straight orange, it's not my yellow orange, it is my red orange. So secondary, tertiary. All right, and if you think back, and we'll just do this one or two times just so you guys have a familiar, if you have your color wheel, so this is what we're talking about, your orange, your yellow orange, your red orange. So the secondary color is orange, that's mixed from red and yellow, equidistanced here makes it orange, and then if you bias it with more red paint, you have a red orange, and if you bias it with more yellow paint, you have a yellow orange. That is the secret of all sunsets there. <laughs> really seriously. It is. Let's, um, uh, no, we're still oranges. Oranges are going to be a second. We're going to go some, we're going to use our cad red, and we're going to see this work again in this palette. You're going to see that what we have is quite a lot of orange as an option in our mix, right? And so we are gonna come here and get our cad yellow. Wow, look at that. So you can see even the differences between that red and that yellow. Now if I take a little of my cad yellow and I mix it into my cad red, I'm gonna get a medium orange. I gotta get it to the medium orange place. The halfway point between them both. And you'll see that that's just a little more luminous and brighter than that orange right there. I'm gonna make sure that's definitely solidly medium orange. They should be about the same value. So if I come in and maybe add a little more yellow into the mix, I'm gonna make the tertiary yellow orange, again, you can see is brighter than what we get from the quinacridone and the lemon yellow. And then I'm gonna mix more red into it. And this is almost like a cad, uh, cad red light or cad orange. Um, it, it really comes close to a pyro orange and that's pretty awesome, right? But wait, because we have split primaries and we need to know what we're making, we can take our quinacridone again. Like I said, we're going into it. You're going to know what you can mix with what you've got because these subtle little differences can make a difference in what you get out of your, uh, out of your palette. So I'm going to come over here and maybe take a little of my quinacridone over here. We're going to make an orange. So the cat definitely makes the quinacridone a little bit brighter. Mix some more yellow into it. But you will see that these are all just a little different from each other. See how we're getting slightly different hues of orange. Okay, so already we have some choices if we were painting a flower that had a lot of different oranges in it. In here, we have a lot of choices, and you can keep adding yellow, and you can keep adding red, and take them to either side. I'm going to come here and do my cad red. I'm sure it needs a heating. Is it good? And then I'm going to get my lemon yellow. And I know this is a lot of work, but sometimes understanding why I'm choosing these mixes, what I'm going for, can make a big difference to your experience. Gonna make a middle orange. Now it's very interesting, the cad red and that lemon yellow. And and I don't know if you need to get up close, John, so they can see the differences. I don't know if it. Not Mike, but they do think that with, there's, a, there's an assumption that cad means bright. Well, cadmium pigments are chosen by artists because they tend to be bright. She said they can't hear my question. I wasn't mine. Yeah, uh, so the, but we're doing the questions at the end. Right. But yeah, generally cadmium pigments tend to be more luminous to the eye and tend to be brighter and more vibrant and resonant. 
right? So if I'm here, if that's my that's my little lemon yellow, and then if I come here, here's my little red orange. Those are all pretty good. Now I've said this before, and uh, I'll say it again. Um, browns will do next because browns are actually an orange. Me. Okay, you want to give me a step? You took my steps away. Yeah, I need a step. So when we're doing oranges and we want to go into the browns and when we're thinking about color theory, we want to think of browns as an orange. Let's talk about some ways that we can make brown. We can take cad red and we can take phthalo green and we can mix a fairly decent brown. Generally, I find it's a little biased to the cad red and the green just kind of takes it into a brown. If I go a little more red into it, it gets a little more close to burnt sienna, right? If I add orange and green together, I get some very interesting browns. So let's take our cad red and a little of our cad yellow together. All right, and we're going to add those to the green. Get a little darker. If I want to darken it, I go more green. All right, look at that. So we've already got some nice browns that we can mix without even using our brown. I'm going to show you a couple more. Now, if you remember from our class where we went over my palette, all uh, quinacridone magenta and phthalo green does not make brown, and that's why we have two reds. Quinacridone magenta and phthalo green makes purple. All right, and we'll go over that in the purples, but that's why we're not going to get into that one at all in this. Another place I can make brown is if I take my cad red and my black, and I'll put those back on the, on, the, on the sheet. We'll make a very dark brown. And then I can just keep adding red. So you see, I can go through a range of browns there. Let's put out our little cad red swatch and our black swatch. And this is just so we can remember things later. You make books like this, these swatching books, so you can remember formulations later when you're like, wait, how can I, I don't have that in my palette. How can I mix that? How can I do that? So let's put that out there. Put out another little black here because we're going to talk about black and orange. So if I take some of this orange, you get a very nice brown. If I add more yellow into it, right, if I go into the yellow orange, I get almost a yellow ochre or raw sienna in that range. So that is cad, that's the cad red, cad yellow orange. Oh, I gotta make the orange, sorry. There we go, that orange. So those are cad red, and you can even make those extra notes if you want them. Another thing that I like to do is I like to take a little bit of my burnt sienna. Let's do the, where we start with the brown, right? So we've started with the brown. If I add cad red to it, it's rather nice. And if I add a little orange to it, it's also rather nice and sometimes is brighter in its pigment. 
So what I'll do is I'll make a little mark with my red and then a subsequent one with my orange and then I'll know that that's that range of them. So if I do cad red or an orange, I get quite a range of color. Look at that. That's a lot of browns, right? That's a lot of browns. Okay, we're doing really good here. Now let's go on and we're going to talk about just real quick. I'm going to actually probably pull this out of the, I have to pull this out of my pad. You don't have to with yours. I do because I use the back of the pad to tape to the, my board. I'm on a tilted board. That's the other reason I very much like these sheets. So we've done oranges and browns. How are you guys doing? I'm going to sip some coffee. We are live. It is so good to see Amy and Kimberly and Carly and Jennifer. The confusion earlier was, does CAD mean brighter automatically? Like, does the manufacturer mean that CAD red is bright red? No. Right. No. It doesn't Cadmium mean that. Cadmium pigment. Right. Like in your batteries. It's the why it's the most expensive paint. Because while, as long as we don't eat it or set fire to it or drink it, it's of no danger to us. Right. And it's bound in the paint. And it's artist cadmium is coated with a pigment to make it less like even if we got some of it in it like we ate it it would be less dangerous to it than true cadmium like in your battery to make the cadmium paint though they have to use particle cadmium pigment and that's why it's expensive to make the paint maker safe we have lost no paint makers that i know of to cadmium making but that's why so it's a pigment released thing when you see the words cadmium hue they don't mean a bright hue. What they mean is that this looks a lot like the color that cadmium makes to most people's eyes. It's the, it's the hue, but not the pigment. Uh, yes, we're going to do pinks real quick. Pinks and peaches. What you're noticing is that we tend to go through color families, right? So we're going through color families, and that's an important thing. So we have two reds here. We have our cad red. We have our quin red. And then we have cad and quin red together. Actually, maybe what I should do is do them each out as their own swatches and then, then hit them. So we'll go. And I'll add. Did not mean to hit that there, but I'll leave it there. I'll leave it alone. Now put this down here. Sometimes my brain gets befuddled. Ignore this swatch of red. All right. So if I were to add white here or here or here, right? That's my mix is quinacridone and cad red and white, cad red and white, or quin uh, quinacridone and white. So let's start with some quinacridone and white. Right, because we've heard that red and white make pink, but oftentimes in painting, because of the way pigment is, it doesn't actually make the pinks we think it makes. So our pinkest pink in this set is generally quinacridone and white. If we add a lot more white to it, we can get a fairly light pink. If we add a lot more quin to it, we get a darker pink. There we go. So get that more vibrant pink that we like. I know, it's work. It's work, it's work, it's work. Now a cad red and quinacridone and white does an interesting thing. And this is a mix that I tend to do. I very much love cad red and quinacridone magenta together as a mix. Right, I think that they do something kind of totally different. So when I go to add white to them, I get this interesting mix. It is not quite the red I'll get with the cad red and white. And it's nice when you're doing like flowers and things to have a few ranges of pink that you can operate through. 
so that it doesn't, uh, you know, overwhelm you. I'm going to do, I'm going to put a little more cadmium over here and probably a little more quinacridone as I go, but we'll put out the cadmium right now. Okay, so just cad red and white makes almost a coral. And that's where our coral is going to live. I'll put it here and here because that's where they are. All right, so just cad red and white. I didn't mean to have that one there. I will probably paint it out later. I'll probably white it out with white paint there so my book makes sense. I'll put this down here so we know where it was. Now if I do a lot more cad red in here, just a little bit of white, you'll see it go much more coral. There we go. Just kind of getting a sense of that. Peaches are orange and white. So I've got to go back into my orange mixes. So if I want to take my cad red and my cad yellow and I mix them together and I make a nice orange. And I add white to that. That's where my peach comes in. So peach is orange and white, not pink and white. And you really change peaches, not just by adding more white, but by biasing the orange. So if you add more yellow to that orange and white, you get kind of that warmer center of the peach color. If you add more red into the orange. Okay, you want me to recap that? All right. So we'll go through that recap again because John always knows when the recaps are. And we're going to not do the telescope. We're going to do the show. I'm sorry. It's just what it is. It's work time. All right. So let's do this again. We've got our orange, right? And when we add white to it, we get our peaches. There's more white, more yellow. If I bias with more yellow, and white. See, it runs through a lot of rains of peach. A lot more white. So this gives us quite a lot to work with in the peach range. Right? Um, and I think the cad red and the cad yellow, right? So this is really cad red, cad yellow. Let's just make a little mark so we can remember cad red, cad yellow to make that orange plus white gives us that range of peaches. You guys doing okay? All right. Yeah, I think so. Everyone's really kind of enjoying this. So I, I know that's a lot. Our pinks tend to live over with our quinacridone. That's what you need to remember. Our pinks live in our quinacridone. We get an interesting pink when we mix quinacridone and cad red to create a red. We get this range of pinks, which is unique. Cad red and cad white tends to make coral, right? And orange is where we get our peach. And I like the cad red and the cad yellow for my orange. Yeah, those are, I've noticed you use those a lot. Yeah, I use those a lot. You can still get a peach out of your quinacridone and your other yellow, and it's a range. I just feel like my peaches live more here. But at this point, you're starting to understand that these are where it takes you, right? Orange and white makes peach. Pink and white makes pink, unless it's a cadmium, which, and the, that's how we know the cadmium is biased. Remember, I said if you add white to it, you can see that bias easier. That's how you see it, is that it's going to go coral. It's never going to go pink. All right. How's everybody doing? I know this Good. is, like, so academic. No, I no, that, All and, right. I, and everybody loves the pinks. That's why I think it was so important to make sure you recap that, because 
you know, it's so easy to get your pink to go the wrong direction of colors. It is easy to get your pink to go the wrong direction of colors. The green family. All right, we got to put out color mixing day is a day where we use a lot of paint. Uh, that these are good colors for beginners. How do you mean? So uh, uh, there, you you sometimes ask to so, talk about something that give well, you no context I was, of I was what sort of, it means. So I, I try to I you try have to, give, to stop and focus. I am. So I was trying to give you some prompts there. Okay. The uh, while you're going through here, some folks were asking, uh, "Is this a uh, are the colors you're asking now a good selection for a beginner palette?" I think these are the best selection for a beginner palette. I think most of the pre-done kits um, out on the market actually give you difficult to mix colors. They don't. They won't always make you a bright purple or bright green in whatever set it is because they won't give you both a ultramarine or a thalo blue. They won't give you both a warm red and a magenta red and they won't give you two yellows. So a lot of times you struggle to get to these secondary and tertiary colors or get to a good pink. And so this palette, I think, is the basic what a beginner needs. These colors, the basic what a beginner needs. That's what I think they were they were kind of asking about. I, I do, yeah, that's, I just needed that context. So I'm going to start with my phthalo blue. We're going to, we know blue and yellow make green. And I'm going to put out two phthalo blues to save myself some time now because now I'm getting kind of orderly. It takes me a minute to find my um, organization. And then I'm going to put my yellow here. My cad yellow here, and let's put our lemon yellow here and see what our greens are. Greens is going to be two pages, I can tell you that right now. Green is a deep, deep well. It's a multi-page. It is a multi-page thing. So if I take my lemon yellow and my phthalo blue, I'm going to get this middle green. I'm looking for my middle green. All right, it's kind of a bright green. If I add a lot of yellow to it, I sometimes have to wipe off pigment when I'm working just so it doesn't get too much. I get this nice bright yellow. If I add a lot more blue to it, I get a green that's almost in a turquoise range. It will remind you a little bit of phthalo green, but it is not phthalo green, and we'll see that once we mix white to it. When we get into the phthalo green and we mix the colors that phthalo green just uniquely mixes that other colors don't mix. I'm going to come here and mix a little of my phthalo blue and my cad yellow together. And that's a nice deep green, isn't it? That's because there's a bit of a bias in the yellow and it starts to deepen it. We play with that a lot of times by adding burnt sienna and we'll get into that a little further in our page, but there's some more yellow in it. I might even get some more and more yellow in there. I find with this range, it's nice to take it through the full range of yellows. So this is not as saturated. These almost remind me of like the tips of spring green leaves and this is more like summer grass in the colors. And without even, you know, adding brown, I can take it into quite a dark green. We will do our ultramarine blue and our yellows. Now, a lot of times I hear inexperienced artists, um, and I was even in this camp for a time of my life, saying that ultramarine blue wasn't a good blue. And it's about the greens here. It frustrates people because ultramarine blue doesn't make any of these greens. However, if you do any landscape painting at all, what you'll find is it does, however, make greens you need desperately. So we'll start with the lemon yellow and the ultramarine blue. It's just a little more... Um, olive or sage just not bright just not saturated if you were trying to get very saturated saturated grass this is pretty tough but if you're trying to make like a color that would work for dry sage 
It's pretty fantastic. I'm going to add a lot more blue. All right. So there's those range there. It's good for natural colors, just not quite as vibrant to the eye. When I take a little bit of my cad yellow and my ultramarine blue, we get really olive color. Look how nice and olive that is. But I didn't have to add any brown to it, and that's actually kind of nice. Sometimes I need to get greens that aren't so vibrant and saturated to the eye. This is a green gold. You can buy green gold paint made for you. Or you can take ultramarine blue and cad yellow and make your own green gold. And there you get a very, very deep, 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 deep green this way. Okay, so we're doing really good there. We're going to stay on our greens. Uh, we're going to get into our other green pigments and my favorite green mixes. And then um, I'm going to show you uh, the greens made from pigments that you don't expect that you have in your palette because sometimes we can make green when we don't expect that we can make green. Okay, so there's our greens looking pretty good. I'll put greens up at the top here. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate that. We're going to continue on. Now, these greens are more advanced greens, but they're not so advanced a beginner can't do them. They're just greens that no one ever thinks to tell beginners about. All right. So the first uh, kind of green that you don't expect that's our basic is black. Actually, I should put up two blocks. Nope. Still greens. It's just a two-pager. Okay, this is one that I use uh, very often when I've got to paint underwater green rocks in shadow, uh, localized shadow where it is green instead of you just add black to it, even though you are in black to this. You are often told never to use black in landscape, but this is my reason why I don't think that's true. So if I take a little bit of yellow and I mix it into my black, and remember I told you guys to treat black <coughs> like a blue? This is why. As you add the yellow to it, you will see a very olive kind of uh, underwater mossy green those you know how we get these greens that are like they're definitely green but it's not the kind of green where you know grass is but it's a natural green and we need it sometimes in the world to create certain effects look at that definitely ranges through green and a lot of people don't think of that and they get confused when they take their first like serious landscape class because the landscape artist almost lives entirely in black and yellow and they're like, what is happening? <laughs> but that's why when you take a serious landscape class, there's a half good chance you are going to run into a black and yellow mix to hit your greens. I'm using my lemon yellow now. You can see that goes into the green much quicker. But it's still green. running out of palette space. It's crazy up in here. Palette day. So see how green those actually are? That's an unexpected kind of, you didn't know that that was a green that you needed. Then um, the other green that you don't know that you probably got is Thalo Blue and Burnt Sienna. So Thalo Blue and Burnt Sienna actually runs a spectrum of um, kind of a gray to this weird green, depending on if it's more brown. If you've got a lot of brown in it, and it's like, it's a weird green. But when you use it on your palette, you'll be like, oh, wow, this is like gray. This is like green. So this is a weird neutralized green, um, and it's used I use it most often when I have an unusual green cast to the sky that I want to do and I kind of can see it when I add white to it it's 
So it runs a gray green and it's one I get into my palette a lot. And that's really because there's just a lot of yellow in burnt sienna or raw sienna or yellow ochre. So when you go into, you forget to sometimes hit your neutrals with your blues, that really does a thing. Now in ultramarine, it just goes straight gray. There's no green cast to it. And then we're going to do my phthalo green pigment. And the first one to know is that when I add white to it, this particular pigment goes the craziest mint. That's why I love it. Look how minty that is. If I choose to add any yellow to the mint, And then if I add more white, there gets to be this really strange and unique kind of little run of colors that I can go through that get more and more saturated. And that's really where I keep adding yellow and white to it. So I'm going to add a little of this mark of this yellow and then a little bit of white so I know that that's kind of what I played with through here. So green and white and yellow and white hit you with a crazy good range. Okay. The other really important kind of green that we get is our turquoise, which is our phthalo blue. And our phthalo green. And actually, you know what? Let's call this a new thing. Let's, let's, uh, nope, not yet. I've actually got to go through. Sometimes I want to separate it and then I go, no, no, this is turquoise. Thalo blue and thalo green is turquoise. Turquoise can run from a range of green to blue. So I tend to um, kind of think of it as a uh, green run because both of these tend to run into that space. You add more white to it. That's how you get that whole range. And then we're going to finish with my favorite green mix. But your best turquoise is there. Uh, when we, the other one we can do is ultramarine blue and phthalo green for teal. So ultramarine blue, phthalo green. Make a very lovely teal. Little different than turquoise, not quite as bright. Just as lovely, nice in an ocean range, but just not quite as bright. You can see there's a brightness in the thalo blue and thalo green, the ultramarine blue and thalo blue don't quite have. And that's how you work those two ranges. So that's your teal. You can um, actually annotate that as teal if you want that extra mark. And then this fin final one is the Sherpa green, which is thalo green. Burnt Sienna, lightened with Cad Yellow. You guys still doing okay? I know we're going through a lot. Yeah. Okay. So those are our three greens. So your, the formulation for Sherpa Green is Thalo Green, Burnt Sienna, Cad Yellow. Man, I use this everywhere. If you paint with me, knowing that this is the color, and it starts with a little bit of my Thalo Green and Burnt Sienna making a deep and forested color. See how deep that is? Then I add yellow to it. And I continually add yellow to it to lighten it up. It gives me a very natural run of colors. And the trick to this is you lighten the green with yellow first before you add white. And you'll know that you need to do that back here because what does the green and white make? It makes mint. So I need to get the green up through all the runs of green with my yellow. This is my most go-to green for landscape painting, most everything. And I just keep adding yellow. And then at the very last, then I can add white. to get my lightest ranges. 
So that's how I get it all the way through that whole range from this dark green to that light green is all the way through here is just yellow and then as soon as I get into my lightest yellow that I'm going to use then I add white and that's how I prevent mint. That is all the greens that you're going to need and once you get versed with this you will play across this space quite a lot but understanding that basic Make notes, write things. If you don't think that you're going to remember your formulations, go ahead and, and write them out. Someday I'll make a color mixing book that you can buy and fill in. Someday. <laughs> I, won't, I won't make you do it by hand. I'll have it all on some paper like this that you have. <laughs> this is going really well. Mm. We'll give you a little warm up there and then we'll go on to the next step. Uh, it's purples, my friend. Purples. So this is another place that people get super frustrated because cad red and any of the blues here are never going to make purple. And I'll use my other red. So we generally think that red and blue make purple, except in pigment they don't. And we talked about that in the why we picked a split primary palette one where we did these exercises a little bit and that is because this is my cad reds these are my quin reds the secret bias in the paint that this is a bit biased yellow and this is a bit biased blue which means that cad red putting out some more of it because i'm going through it like crazy color mixing day goes through paint but this exercise will save you paint in acrylic april so it's worth doing or just generally in your painting, you will save a lot of money doing this exercise. So if I take cad red and cad blue together, I distinctly don't get purple. What if I add white to it? Well, it's kind of gray. That's not going to be purple. And it's a lovely gray. Do I need to know that? Oh yeah, that's fantastic. See, so even when you discover that you have a paint that doesn't make purple as you expected, goodness gracious, if I keep adding white to it, look at that gorgeous gray blue. How beautiful for winter. Good to know that my um, cad red and my phthalo blue, I'm going to get some of that here and just make sure I mark that out so that I remember that I've got cad red and cad blue doing this work for me. Well, what, what about cad red and, and, and ultramarine blue? That's got to be better, right? Mm. Well, there's a bit of a purple cast to it, but mostly it's also gray. Makes lovely granite. Great stones, great shadows. I love it so much. I use ultramarine blue for this reason in most of my skin tones because it cools my skin tones without removing the skin tones. Like they still feel like their skin tones are just skin tones in shadow. Right? Oh my gosh, I just did that on the wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Cad red and ultramarine blue. Ah, gotcha. I just mixed it up, so I'm going to have to. So what you guys don't know is that yesterday I was at, like, I, I think I vomited for two days straight. <laughs> Pretty much, you were right? You feeling very Day good, yeah. and night vomiting. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't feeling great. And then a headache that made me question being alive. So that was my life. You know, and so that's, that's, there we go. Ultramarine blue, cad red, cad red, thalo blue. So now we know. Let's get into our quins. Now this is going to change up a lot. Quinacridone, magenta, and thalo blue make a beautiful, I mean, uh, ultramarine blue make a beautiful purple. It's just stunning. You can take it more red to make it more magenta. 
You can add more blue to make it more uh, indigo or purple. And when you add white, it's very distinctly purple. Just making sure the color is mixed thoroughly so when I swatch it out. So you can see that that is definitely and distinctly purple. If I go into the pink I had earlier, right, you can see it just goes even more purple. So my range of purples, my brightest range of purples organically in this set is quinacridone magenta and ultramarine blue for mixing. And I can go all the way through a magenta purple to a like a deep indigo purple uh, through light lilacs and lavenders and those colors very easily. Let's put out some more white because we're running thin on it. And we'll put out a little more ultramarine. I don't know if we need it again, but I'm going to put it out to just make sure. I think we're coming through purples will be good. All right, because you got some grays. We're not going to work about chromatic blacks or grays right now. We're just getting to the basic color mixes you need to know about. Are you no, still purple. I don't want red. I wanted ultra, I want quinacridone magenta and thalo blue. So that's why I'm struggling here, guys, is I've just, I haven't eaten and I've been vomiting. <laughs> but I was feeling well enough today to not cancel the class, so I didn't. All right, so let's take a little of the quinacridone and the thalo blue. And it is kind of a purple, isn't it? I can mix more red into it. So we're getting kind of a purple. What it is is my water is super dirty. I would suggest changing your water more often than I'm able. It? It's okay. You know, I can add a little more white to it. And you see, we can get through this range. We can get a whole nice range of purples and deep blues very easily. Not going to be here. Everything here is gray is gray. Everything there is gray. Cad red and ultramarine uh, blue and cad red and thalo blue are grays. That's where they're going to be. And you should put a little note to remind yourself that these make gray. Now I have doxazine purple. Why would I bother? Well, first of all, because when you add white to doxazine purple, you will see very quickly that we get a whole different range of purples then I mix. These are much more saturated. Doxazine purple is one of the most tinting, staining, powerful pigments out there. It can work as a black if you don't have any black in your palette too because it's chromatically so dark. Naturally, this is, sometimes people can't even tell the difference on the palette from the black to the purple because it's so dark. And you can see this gives me just a lovely mix right? That's just fantastic for those purples. Another thing is, is when I'm doing sunsets, if I take a little cad red, just trying to get it to some clean water here, and a little dox purple together. I get a unique set of colors that you see in sunsets where the sky is going from a purple cloud to an orange and it's a really nice and easy way to transition those, right? And even when you do uh, the cad red and docks purple and you add a little white to it, you get some very nice and interesting colors as well that are unique to sunsets perhaps. Isn't that lovely? And then if you'll remember, I told you that quinacridone magenta and thalo green do not give you a uh, brown, as you would expect. So if I take green, and I'm almost out of palette room for this. I'm so glad we're <laughs> getting there. So if you take thalo green and quinacridone magenta, the surprise color that you're always going to get is purple not brown, but it's a lovely purple. It's a super interesting and lovely purple.
right? Just in the same way that dioxazine purple and phthalo green give you blue. I like a whole video about that. I'll take some quinacridone magenta. You can really see it happening here. So it's sort of a grayed purple. It's certainly different than the dioxazine purple, and it's different than these li lilacs. So I would say your best kind of like little lilacs and having a lot of control happens here. I sometimes also like to take quinacridone and work it into this purple as well uh, to make transitions through skies. And so understanding where your purples live is a very important place. Okay, we've done it. I have stayed upright, which I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do. <laughs> Just, oh, but I'm here. That's, we did. And I have not passed out. I think that's very colors. good. Don't you? Yeah. I think it's good. I'm tough enough. Do we have questions? Okay. So is diox violet the same as diox purple? No. Two different colors. I noticed the brands of colors vary slightly. What causes that? Um, they each have different formulations. There's no industry standard for brushes, for paint, for anything. Some companies like Golden or Sennelier, big companies, right? They got together with ASTM, ASTDM. Mm, yeah, I know, I always maybe, say it wrong. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's like the letters. You always say the letters wrong. I say it wrong. It's ASTDM, I think. That sounds and, close. And what it is, is that's a voluntary standard where all the experts in paint and their historical researchers got together and said, we think Indian yellow could have looked something like this, even though we don't really know how it was made. We don't think it was mango leaves and urine from cows, but whatever it was, we don't know how to make it, but we think it was this color based on paintings and things we've looked at. And so then they'll all kind of agree on a general hue, but there isn't anything, and it's a pretty broad range too. So... Like in Sennelier, the doxazine purple is really deep, right? Now, they've been making paint for contiguously for like 250 years. So their dioxazine purple is probably historically one of the more accurate purples out there because they've just been making that long. Um, and other companies might make it a little easier to mix through these magentas. So you might find like Golden Artist Colors does that. Maybe this brighter, bright purple just a little differently than Saint-Elier. But they'll both work in these ways that we demonstrated out well enough that you don't have to worry that much. Burnt Siennas have a huge variance. Raw Siennas have a huge variance. Yellow Ochres have a huge variance. And the important thing to remember is yellow ochre and yellow oxide are the same hue. One is made chemically and one is made from nature. That's the difference. Um, and it used to be that on cadmium pigments, you didn't have any alternatives that were e like equal to them. But now you do. Golden, Golden Artist Colors has come up with, they're called, bed, I can't say it, bedendazine. Bedendazine. It's a B word. Um, they have some colors now in the yellows and reds that are as vibrant that, that don't use cadmium pigment. So for the variety of reasons that you may choose not to have it in your house, which is super reasonable, um, those are some good options. Hue is always a good option. Um, Golden Artist Colors makes, I think, the best hues for the cadmium ranges of any of the companies. Um, but I think that saint Elier and maybe Holbein make the best cadmiums of any of the companies. So some companies are better at stuff than other companies. It's weird, like they, cause they hire chemists and chemists are kind of like artists. These pigment chemists are artists and then they have people that source the pigment. And I think the way to think of them is like the Indiana Joneses of the, the art world. They have to go into crazy locations in the world and negotiate with people. And oftentimes pigments are, you know, uh, very prized resource in an area. And so they also have to think about the uh, ethicness and the sustainability of a pigment. Sometimes they're culturally protected. Lead white, believe it or not, is culturally protected by Japan. Um, and so it's very hard for uh, companies to get true lead white, like that we would all think of, because it's it's a natural national treasure. Um, that that you don't get a great one from Michael Harding Oils, you do. He has to make it himself, which is super life-threatening and dangerous, but, you know, um, he chooses to do that. So sometimes there's this sort of artistry to the art of making color. Um, you can, here's a fun thing you might not know. You can buy pigment and make your own paint with a muller 
and uh, 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 a good solid like marble or glass tray that's made for that. And you can make acrylic paint, oil paint, or watercolor paint. Um, and Sennelier will sell you the pigment and the mediums to do that yourself very easily at home, including all the tools. You can make your own paint if you want to do that. It's easiest to make oil paint and easiest, easiest to make watercolor paint. On my watercolor channel, I show you how to make paint and watercolor make your own paint and you can buy pigments on Amazon anymore like uh all the uh what are they they're they're mica pigments mm -hmm. yeah you can buy all these really amazing mica pigments on and the mica pigments are very safe on uh Amazon and make your own watercolor paint uh Patty uh, Hoffman makes paint in our community we have a bunch of people in our community that make paint their own watercolors it's a ton of fun um you will find though that having a four roller mill does make better paint than you just mulling <laughs> your little heart out <laughs> but sometimes it's fun to mull your little heart out it's like you make these little circles and you scrape it all back and you make these little circles and how long you choose to mull and the way that you choose to incorporate those pigments and the particulate um that's why you sometimes see colors in oil painting that you can't see in acrylic because it does not mull into polymer it will beautifully work into oils or into uh, gum arabic but it is not going to go into an acrylic polymer and you can buy the plain acrylic polymers with no pigments in them that's honestly what most of your mediums are is the polymer without the pigment in it at different viscosities um, but you buy the one that's the base one and so you don't have to do all the science of figuring out the anti-sulfacants and surfacants and all those things that they have to do in the acrylic polymer and you can buy the pigment and you can make your own what you will find though is there's a sweet spot like if you add too much burnt sienna to the paint it actually becomes less luminous and so there's artistry in that um, if you're really really into being into art there are these training courses if you have the time in life that you can take at golden artist colors and they um, certify you to be a golden artist instructor kind of a thing and you can talk about these paints and pigments and actually see them make paint and be very immersed in that world and um uh, you know, if you if you're in the area and you're upstate New York and you can take a tour of the Golden Factory, please call first and make an appointment. Don't just show up on them. Um, it's really kind of an extraordinary thing. Like fun fact I learned from Golden, hardest color to make is thalo blue. I would have thought it was cadmium because cadmium is dangerous, but they're like, no, there's like safety things and we have a whole thing. And itself, it makes very easily. Um, and once it's made into the acrylic paint, it's not harmful to you or me in the way that you might, it doesn't have VOCs or anything. I wouldn't paint with it if there had been any indication ever that it was dangerous to paint with. Um, I don't paint with uh, lead paint and oils for that reason, right? Because I'm just like, oh, I'm going to eat paint or do something stupid. I know I am. So <laughs> maybe I don't do that. But to see them talk about how the paint is made and the way that they clean a mill and reset a mill and the way they tube paint and how much craftsmanship and artistry is in it. I tell you the thing that it made me feel better about is what I had to pay at the art store for the paint. When I saw the paint being made at the different companies, it did change. I think before I was on YouTube and I was just a regular working artist buying paint, I think I thought Golden was a company that was for fine artists and that they didn't care about regular artists. I think I thought um, I don't, I, that, that I didn't understand why the paint was priced what it was. And sometimes I kind of thought that companies were a little crazy, like why this variety of range of paint. But when I got on YouTube and I started having to answer your questions in the way that you guys asked me questions. And then I, that meant I had to go find out, like we went to the golden artist factory. <laughs> like, let's go find we out. We need to learn. It's a, it's a whole series of videos. You can see me go. And I like, I got I got like, I teared up. I got real touched and it changed how I felt about Golden entirely. Like once I met Mark Golden, it changed how I felt about Golden. But when you really, but it's meeting everybody at the company. It's meeting everybody there. When you talk to the guy who, who is in charge of Fabriano paper, or you talk to the people who make Senelier paint, what you find are people who love love what they do you talk to anybody at royal talents they love what they do and they love all artists at every level they love beginners they love professionals but i want you to know that they love anyone painting it's not just chihuly who gets the love yeah he might get the private paint made for him because he can afford to pay for that because golden makes private lines of paint but um if you have if you have the dough <laughs> you can get private stuff made um 
but they love all the artists equally. They are invested in your safety. Um, that's why I have some confidence in the safety of cadmium paint is I've talked to the people making it and asked them, how, how assured should I be and why? And the chemists will sit and answer your questions and the, the paint makers and, and they're like, you know, we don't have a lot of people that can make paint, so we're definitely not gonna hurt them. And you see a guy who's been working in a company, you know, 40 or 60 years, it definitely makes you think that. And for that world, brush making gets even more involved with apprenticeships and craftsmanship and an understanding. And they have the same sourcing stuff. The art world, the art material world, when you know more about it, it you love the people who make the art materials and you love the art materials themselves. And you no longer feel weird about the price because you go, oh. Because you want people, I think we all want people to be paid for their work, right? We just don't want to be ripped off. I don't want to be price gouged, right? That's what I don't want. I don't want a ridiculous price just because somebody thinks in a corporate office that I can afford it and carry their load so they can go on an extra vacation and make 400 times the salary of anyone who works at their company. But guess what? Golden is employee owned, so that doesn't happen there. And you'll find again and again and again in art companies, there's a culture of caring about the people who work for them and caring about the people who buy the products. You will find in art stores, they care very much about the artists that buy the products. It is a small community. It's such a small industry that if you're a paint company and you go to a guy that sells caps because you need to recap your paint with a new better cap, some paint companies had to go through this recently, and that person who sells to Hershey's and all these different companies, here's the number of orders that they have. They will walk out of your office laughing. True story. Just put down the papers and walk out laughing. Get in the car and drive away. Just laughing. It's a small, small industry and it's a small, small community. And now because people figured out that they could make paint, there's all these people on Etsy and stuff hand making paint. So there's these new paint companies coming up. Look at my, the Jasper Stardust makes those beautiful handmade brushes and he makes paint. Like you meet these people, uh, uh, there's a, a I shared the coupon on it before. What's the, the son and mother team they make the paint that did the motorcycles and the, oh, um, God, they're amazing. And why am I not remembering their name now? Cause I threw it's, up it's for begins two on, It's because it begins on a, uh, it begins on A. Uh, no, no, uh, maybe it was graphics. They had the really cool... Uh, uh, alpha, alpha, yeah. alpha, 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 alpha six graphics, alpha six. Alpha, is it alpha six acrylic? I think I mean, it's alpha six acrylic think... moderators, you know, because I put out the coupon before. Um, that's why I put out their coupon. I just think they're so cool. I don't even do, I don't paint on leather. I don't paint on shoes. I don't paint on motorcycles. I don't do that type of art, but I'm about it. All right. Do we have another question? I know I'm kind of waxing yeah, on. Uh, Are see. the golden artist visits online your videos, says Lynn. Yes. It's a, it's a whole thing. You can just see me get on a plane and go around and talk to John. You can you just go with us on the whole trip. It's so goofy. It was like we thought we would do a travel vlog. I don't know what we were thinking, but we filmed everything from leaving on the airplane to arriving at Golden to mm -hmm. leaving again. Yeah. So funny. And then we made a short video of the uh, paint tubes being filled that reminded me of like, remember the Sesame Street videos where they would show you something being made and it was super satisfying? We made one of those. I don't know. Real quick here. So um, Misty was asking, if my magenta looks slightly purplish, can I add a color to mix it for a pink magenta? Hmm, I guess it's going to depend really upon the paint itself. Yeah, it uh, depends. If you had a Quinn Red, you could probably take it into that more... Um, I carry my Quinn Magenta and my Cad Red because that gets me for the full range. And, and, and there is a purple kind of thing. Some people take the extra step to buy Opera Pink. Opera Pink is carried by a couple of paint companies and it is a vibrant, super saturated pink that you can't really mix easily. Um, sometimes I also find that if I add a little cad red into it, that I get a little bit more into a pink that I like it. I have to find that balance, but once it has the bias of blue, right? You, you have to either do a pure primary red, which you would just could use for your pink anyways, or, um, you just go and opera pink. But the reason of doing these color charts is if you do this color and you're like, I am not getting a pink I like, then you can go buy a paint of tubes a tube of paint, right? Because then you'll know, like, I don't care. I don't like any of that purple. Then you can go find a purple that you really love, right? Or if you don't like any of those greens, you could go find a convenience color that you really love because pigment paint is different than mixed paint. Pigment paint is brighter. Um, now they have blends where the 
where they mix it for you and you'll see that all the pigment codes are sort of blended on there. But when you see that it's a single pigment code on a tube of paint, that is a paint that that's the pigment and you probably aren't going to mix that. You could mix a hue that comes close visibly to the eye, but it's just not quite the same. Weird thing to know. Because I didn't know, I didn't used to know that. I thought it was all just mixable. And then I learned, oh no, opera pink, no matter what I do in the universe, I'm not, get, I think I have opera pink over there. Can I, can I, oh, you want to get it? I have some opera pink, I think, in that bucket. I don't think I gave it back to mom yet. No, no, in that cardboard bucket. Ah, well, there's, here's a pink. Luminous opera. I got luminous opera. And this is crackdown pink. Okay, here's a pink. Oh, this is a gray pink and you can't get this pink anywhere else. Well, we'll put these up here. We can swatch it out. I'll, sh I'll swatch these out for you so you can see them. Okay, I'm going to swatch out. This is quinacridone rose, which is basically uh, an opera pink. You can kind of see that pink there. And then if you really, really, that's by Sennelier. And then um, Luminous Opera. <laughs> this is so crazy. <laughs> Okay, so this actually does glow in the dark and stuff. It is a neon paint, but they're they're light fast for longer than other neons. And you only get this color from Holbein. They're the only ones that make it. That's why sometimes you'll see artists like, you've got to get this one tube of this one color from this one company. But this is like so bright, you're never going to mix that hue. And this is a lovely true pink. So if you're having trouble and you want to get that extra tube, and there's some violets that are like that. You know, and there's some weird greens like Southern Ocean Blue and um, Australian Sienna by Matisse Derivan. I love those two colors. You can't really mix them and they do stuff together. You can't imagine if you can get them and you want to add them to your bucket. These are the basic paints. That's the eight colors that you need. And then, you know, and then you get the convenience, which is the docks, the burnt Sienna and the Thalo Green. And then, you know, so I guess that gets it to 11. And then there you are, you're where you need to be. You can always add another one. It's still considered a limited palette, guys. So that's kind of nice. And once you start investing in colors that you're like, man, I know that I definitely, definitely want this, then it's like nobody's business. Do we have any more questions? And I, I don't, we don't, we have this color in the store. I don't think we have this color because no whole buying, but we do have the, um, Quinacridone rose. On the store, they were asking about Canadian shipping yet. Uh, so, yet. no. 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 Unfortunately, it's in the contiguous United States. However, come now. So, here's the thing. We need to be able to get to Canada. We need to be able to get to the UK and globally. So, one, we're going to have a conversation at NAMTA. If it's possible, there may be a route to make it possible. If I learn that it's not possible at my trip to NAMTA, we're in Ireland imminently like really really soon like we're starting to pack up we think um and uh once we're over there we're going to start uh connecting to like uh Senele and the different companies over there and see if we can do a similar thing over there it doesn't change that our north american store will remain our north american store right not north american Canadian united states gosh i'm right, yeah, sorry yeah. threw up so for two days and US, i just learned yeah. this lesson on so, the last color mixing that's thing. okay yeah our u.s store that, that we sell in the united states we're going to be expanding that to other territories as we get permission and we work out the shipping complications because different tax districts different shipping blah, different blah, packaging blah. requirements yep and so in some cases we're we're just going to work with different uh warehouses in those different areas and as we go into those we might have new brands like pedio yeah. like we might be able to expand brands we might be able to get into holbein give me a second i'll go to japan and i will get it <laughs> oh, big. i would yeah. like to have all the supplies that's my thing when you like to have all the supplies all of them all, all of, of them. them that's what i keep telling them i want all i think you're of working that. on it well it's gonna it's gonna be like we've got a couple thousand now we're trying. Right? Yeah, we're we got that's right. We got about a couple thousand in there. <laughs> so we're and so and and then our other thing that we're trying to do in the store is um to make sure that our prices are uh based on cost. That's it, based on cost. And and not and and I, I feel like we're not being greedy at all. Everyone agrees we like got with some experts and honestly I have to answer to the whole team and the whole team are sure bets, so they would be like, no. 
Um, so if there's a price on something, it's because that's what I legally have to sell it at, like because there's minimum assured pricing on stuff um, with companies and we can't do gray markets. I'm not gonna do any illegal or shady purchasing. Um, I don't have any of my own house brands yet, like Art Sherpa brands, but I'm gonna give me a minute, like when travel gets open, like I get settled and I can like get to some different places to talk to some different brush makers or um, different like stuff. Like I, I haven't even gotten to sit down with people at San LA yet and be like, hmm, <laughs> we should have a thing. But I don't really need it anymore because you just buy it at my store. Right? Just go buy right. it at the just store. Go, just go get it. Just go get it. You see it on the show. Chances are, half good chances are it's at the store. If it's not at the store, it's imminently going to be at the store and it's going to be a good price. And um, while we're working out all the technical challenges of having an online retailer, our people are there. They're writing back. They're, you know, you just tell us. <laughs> I don't want you not to tell me if there's a problem. I want you to tell me if there's a problem. I don't want you. I, I want you to tell me that things are going good. Yes, please gush. I love that you guys do that. Please gush. But also, if there's a thing that we need to work on or fix, don't don't hesitate to write support at theartsherpa.com. Let us know if the thing miscalculated shipping. Let us know anything, right? And, you know, I think hopefully that's going to be a good thing. And when, as soon as we get it all worked out and settled, we'll do the big 700,000 subscriber <coughs> celebration giveaway thing. I just have to work the kinks out of the store first. And then we're going to, we're going to do a big giveaway yeah thing. and then someday they'd like for you to uh well two things we we're asking for a link for the store we'll get that in there for you but the other thing was is uh, someday can you uh swatch your more co your convenience colors yeah we did it in the last video oh yeah we did it in the last video um but i don't mind uh doing them right now too so da, 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 da. and then we got the purple can see that one there so that's the phthalo green that's the dioxazine purple and that's the burnt sienna and those are those are my convenience colors I do also have yellow ochre where are you yellow ochre here you are I just want to point out how close I got on my palette to yellow ochre, just mixing it though. Um, and this is the yellow ochre that I tend to do. And then, you know, I do recommend, if you can get Holbein paint, I do recommend the Luminous Rose, just if you ever need a, like a psycho bright pink, like from the 80s, and the um, quinacridone pink or quinacridone rose, this is quite lovely as a pink. They have a nice range of pinks. There's a beautiful range of colors. I wish I had my whole swatch board for this company's complete line because I will eventually have it. I want to sell that at the store. I'll have to ask about that. So um, that is the convenience colors. I do think it's nice to have. The reason I keep yellow ochre around is that it's a nice base in skin tones. Just a whole range of skin tones. So that's a good thing. All right. Do we have any other questions? There's a lot of store questions uh, about uh, uh, shipping times and things like that. And, and for all that stuff, you guys, uh, support at theartsherpa.com is the best place because a lot of those things vary specifically based on your questions and things. Oh, the um, convenience colors I don't use on the show is is what Carly meant. Yes, but I have to get to Ireland and then my, then my studio has to get to Ireland, which is like six months away. Because most of my not, so I have these emergency colors that I travel with which is this core palette. And then I have everything, everything, everywhere, all at once, <laughs> like every other art supply, but that's in a crate right now. And yeah, the, the last thing was, is that uh, at some point they'd like for you to do a little lesson on paint management. Oh, that'd be a fun video to do. Like how I managed to like eke out little pieces. How did you manage that? <laughs> such a journey. <laughs> it's such a journey, isn't it? it is yeah i should do that again i want to do that again now uh saturday is the renaissance bunny don't miss that it is a three hoot i wrote a post on my facebook page and it's in the community tab here on 
YouTube about how to know if you're a one hoot, two hoot, or three hoot painter, and do I mean these are all for beginners? And um, I answered that question very, very thoroughly, which they all are for beginners, but remember beginners come in different stages. And um, I think the journey to get from beginner to uh, uh, independent, confident, intermediate painter is a pretty long one actually, compared to the rest of your journeys in art. And um, so that's why everything I have is for beginners and it is broken down. And, and a lot of people came in and were like, look, I do three hoots all the time and I'm a beginner and it's easier than you think. I rate the hoots, you know, about it being higher if there's more tools, more colors, more techniques, if we're sitting for a longer amount of time, because sometimes that can be really fatiguing and you have to build up to that. The Renaissance Bunny is a don't miss though, because then it's a month of abstract. From right. April 1st to April 30th, I hope you're coming and doing the Acrylic April Challenge, um, which I think is going to be really good. Um, we had some news on the books. We're changing how we're printing them and doing some things. But luckily, the schedule hasn't changed much. So they're still coming out. So we'll still be dropping Acrylic April books from 2020 to 2023 over, over April. And that will make a big difference for those of you guys that want books for that. Um, with those written instructions, I, I really think it's going to be, things are going to be getting really wild and crazy. We got a lot more control than we've ever had. Ha having the art store, the online art store gives us so much more control than we've ever, ever had. I'm, I, it, it also makes us more responsible than we've ever, ever been. So that's yeah. a little nerve wracking, yes. but I can handle it. I can yeah, take this it. This has been awesome. It has been awesome. And I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to work on your color mixing. It's going to make all your painting easier. It'll make the bunny easier. It makes everything easier because once you get confident in your color mixes and you know where they are and you know where to hit your green gold versus your bright, you know, uh, spring gold, then you start whipping around that color palette and you're like, oh, I need my black and yellow for that underwater green or, oh, I'm going to use ultramarine blue to cool down these colors and give it a shadow run. You're going to start to really get a sense of how all this really, really works. And yeah. I'll keep dropping these little videos because I, I never think it hurts us for us to go back to the beginning. I may start dropping them as shorts, little one minute like recaps of what, a color mix what that you can save into a playlist. What time are our color April videos going to start dropping? They are April 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Central, 11 a.m. Mountain, and 10 a.m. Pacific. And I don't know the Irish time yet. I think it's, five, I think it's hours. 5 p.m. or something. Yeah. I think it's like, I will know it soon, though, won't I? I yeah. will know it all soon. I'm oh pretty my sure goodness, it's, it's, we're it's, so pretty, close. it's pretty close to 5 p.m. there. Oh, we gotta do an Irish meetup. I gotta, I gotta we'll find out we'll who all is in Ireland yep. and paints with me. We're gonna do a whole video on that as soon as we get the as soon as we get there. The notes that we're waiting for. We're waiting for notes. We're also waiting on housing. <laughs> That's the notes. <laughs> That's the notes. We're waiting on housing, but it'll be okay. It'll be all yeah. good. We'll have a house. We have, we'll we have options. It'll be wonderful. We have, all right. We'll talk about that later, though. <laughs> okay, guys, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other, and I want to see you at an easel really soon. Bye bye.